Coming up this week on the Course of Life podcast, our front nine golf conversation includes a legend out of prison, LPGA newcomer Gabby Ruffles joining us with an exclusive debate on potato chips and a hilarious record on the PGA Tour, an emotional moment, and some other golf headlines, including a safari hunt and a win down under for a familiar face. Plus, we get into all things Christmas as we're officially hitting that holiday season stride. And this week's second guest, our featured guest, is a friend of the show, rapper Nick Moody. His music is going to the next level. He has a big career update and announcement for us as well. And when we always end with food, it's a PSA and some important notes as we head into Thanksgiving prep week. And all of it is brought to you by our friends at Desert Fox Golf. We talk about them every week. Desert Fox Golf is not only a great holiday gift because they make great golf accessories for everyone, and you can check those accessories out at desertfoxgolf.com. But if you are a golfer right now that is listening and you're playing in a large-scale event or you're running a large-scale event or you have a charity in the event in the future where you think Desert Fox products should be there, hit us up on Instagram. We'll give you a cash referral if your event ends up buying Desert Fox products. That's right. It's that easy. Just send us a DM on Instagram at COL Podcast. DM us at COL Podcast. Tell us a little bit about the event that's coming up and say, hey, they should have Desert Fox here. Get us connected. We'll do the rest. And that's right. A cash referral in your hands just for being a golfer that's golfing and playing in fun events that use Desert Fox golf products. So check out the phone caddy, the swing eight tumblers, the towels, the merchandise, the accessories, the cigar holders, and everything they offer to golfers from Desert Fox Golf are friends of the show, and they could be the supplier of your next great golf event as well. Check them out at DesertFoxGolf.com. interwebs and welcome to course of life we are proud to be presented by our friends at desert fox golf and the live take app i'm michael he's alex and let's lead off the front night alex with the holidays it's mid-november we're just uh, a week and a half away as we record this from thanksgiving oh yeah we're which means we're like a month and a week or so away from christmas talk to me it's it's here it's uh, how are we feeling? Give me that sweet holiday love language. I, I'm eating it up right now, mainly because uh, I'm within 48 hours removed of doing the full fall to Christmas decoration switch in the house. Ugh. So obviously the, the buzz is still going. That absolutely kills some people like you and traditionalists that like to wait till after Thanksgiving, but we couldn't wait any longer. I just wrote, wrote a preview piece on the college football bowl season. The weather's getting cool. Black Friday's around the corner. We're going to get into a lot of Thanksgiving prep at the end of the episode. We but will. yeah, I'm just overall feeling the good vibes. And uh, I'm, I'm unearthing the Christmas story shirts and sweaters I have as well, too. Okay. Well, we'll we'll keep that at bay for a little while. Let's wait till we get uh, through Thanksgiving before we take out the Christmas shirts. Yeah, okay? you got a little celebration, too, in addition to Thanksgiving as well, too. So I know we don't want to overlook that as well. Yeah, there's Hanukkah. Yeah. <laughs> Hanukkah's first. <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, talk about the Bermuda championship down there, uh, for the PGA tour. One of the last money events of the year. Yep. Um, before we talk about Camilo Villegas and his incredible victory, uh, let's talk about Adam Long because yes, that's wow. right. <laughs> this was a very unique stat and a unique stopping point for the stat as well too. Adam Long setting a PGA tour record. Okay, Mike, for hitting fairways in a row. Well what do you what do you think is your record for how many fairways in a row you have hit playing golf in your lifetime? <laughs> what, would, what would you venture to guess that that number is? Two. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say maybe it's like three or four for me. Yeah. I think being realistic, like dead serious, I don't think I've ever hit more than four fairways in a row. Yeah. Dead serious. Adam Long hit 69 fairways in a row. All you little teenagers can start laughing out there. Yes, he stopped at the unbelievable humorous number that goes viral all over the internet. 69 fairways in a row, a PGA Tour record for Adam Long. That is some incredible accuracy and and, and a pinpoint accuracy to stop at that number specifically as well. The thing is, though, he's hit 69 fairways in a row, but how many events has he won? Yes. Uh, so the answer, the answer is zero. You, yep. Yeah. Would you rather hit 69 fairways in mm. a row or would you rather have 69 greens in regulation? 
Mm, that's a good question. Well, 69 in a tournament means you miss only three the entire week. So maybe yeah. in a week, I would take that. This stretch has lasted a couple tournaments um, for him to get the 69 fairways in a row. So, yeah, I think in the end, maybe if we're settling that driver, you know, show putt for dough argument, I think I would take the 69 greens over the 69 fairways in a row. Uh, regardless, really cool and awkwardly uh, funny achievement for 69 fairways in a row for Adam Long, uh, which concluded uh, Saturday morning in Premier. Camilo Villegas, as I said, uh, won the Bermuda Championship. This is his first win in nine years. Wow. Uh, And what's more impressive, of course, is that back in 2020, I think it was, he lost his daughter, who is four months, six months old, I think is when she passed. Um, And... So he has a son now as well, but his the support of going from really kind of losing his game and then having that happen in his personal life and turning really then being able to turn it all around and having his fans and, and friends and team believe in him to get back in the winner's circle. Uh, incredible victory for him. It was huge. It was. Yeah, like you said, really awesome to see just his name back on the board. He's in kind of a yeah. name of our past that we hadn't seen in a bit, and to see him resurrect his career yet again after that horrible tragedy you mentioned of a couple weeks ago. Where we're on back-to-back weeks with some unbelievably feel-good stories coming off of Eric Van Royen winning for his terminal cancer um, diagnosed best friend who he played college golf with, uh, to this story with Camille Vijegas and overcoming that horrible tragedy um, to find success professionally again a couple very emotional moments and just kind of speaking to that theme of uh, golf is just one of those sports that produces so many stories that make you think about the greater good of the game the game is not only for competition it's a game that helps us get through things get past things celebrate things honor things that are great in life so great to see camille back in the winner's circle it is indeed. So we'll see him at the players now. Um, and uh, if he does well in the next week's event at Sea Island coming up, he may be in all yeah. these new signature, all the signature events. He needs to have a good finish and then he'll be in the signature events. Oh, that's great to see. I love it. So that'd be great. The LPGA uh, had Annika's event because Annika just, you know, it's Annika. She's like tiger on steroids in the LPGA. Well, they were saying this past week in the press conferences, and I'll get to it in a moment, but it was just the players were thrilled that Annika actually has an event to call her own. You know, on the PGA Tour, we had Byron Nelson's event. We've got Jack Nicklaus's event, the Memorial. We've got Arnold Palmer's, the Bay Hill. Tiger's even putting his name on events now. So it's great to see the LPGA doing something similar, paying tribute to a legend and having an annual stop on the calendar that does that. And I mean, what what better ambassador to the female golf game than Annika Sorenstam? Great, exactly. Great pick. And uh, you were able to get remote credentials to this event. I was. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting situation where I obviously couldn't be there in Tampa for the event. But the LPGA, I'm very thankful for them, allows us to cover events remotely and give spotlight to everything that's great in the women's golf game and the landscape. Uh, so I was able to look in and check out the Zoom press conferences, got to catch up and ask a quick question to our friend of the show, Stacy Lewis. Uh, she's obviously had a very long year. She's quite exhausted, but uh, posted that inf- uh, answer on Instagram. So be sure to follow on social for those uh, social exclusive clips as well too and then also got to have a really cool conversation that's going to come your way right now with a newcomer on the lpj tour she just won three times on the epson store tour to get her to the next level and uh she goes by the name of gabby ruffles and it was a really com- real cool really cool conversation with a usc alum who is now making her way on the lpj tour thanks for having me on Definitely, yeah. So let's start right where you're at now. You're playing in Annika Sorenstam's event, getting a sponsor's exemption into the event. That's got to feel really special for you uh, growing up in the game, obviously. Yes, yeah, super special. Um, I got the call up on Tuesday that I got the spot and I was just kind of not doing much in Palm Springs where my parents um, are at. So I was super excited to kind of get out here and um, come play an LPGA event now as uh, a member for next year. So I'm super grateful to be here. It's such a beautiful spot in Tampa and a great golf course and um, played here three years ago. So happy to be back. Nice. Yeah, it's really cool to have you on the stage you're in right now. Obviously, we all know we're about a year removed from a situation that you handled really well when you accidentally missed registering for Q School. It kept you on the Epson tour. But now that we're removed from that, you've taken care of a lot of business this year to get yourself back where you are now. What's, What's the big takeaway from that era for you? Yeah, no, I mean, all in all, I think it was kind of a blessing in disguise, really. Um, I, you know, 
two years ago, I finished 15th on the money list. And then obviously got into Q series by finishing 15th. But, um, you know, I didn't kill it on the Epson tour and I still had a lot to learn and a lot to improve on. And, um, so coming back that next year, I, it was just all about improving myself and improving my standard. And I knew that things would take care of itself if I, you know, played better. And it was just about really playing better. So I was, um, you know, I'm grateful for the year that I've had and grateful for that kind of situation. It all ended up working out and learned a lot from it. So um, all in all, I'd say a blessing in disguise. Definitely. Yeah. And you kind of mentioned in passing that you contended that original season on the Epson tour, but hadn't really lifted trophies or felt what it was like to be winning or, or in the lead down the stretch. Tell me a little bit about learning how to win and, and kind of what you learned about your game and what it feels like for you down the stretch of a tournament. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think learning how to win is a huge thing. Um, and you don't get to no amount of practice equates to uh, the feeling of putting your just doing it and putting yourself in that situation and seeing how you respond. It's definitely different to being, you know, last off on 10 on a, you know, on a Sunday and right. um, to having a two shot lead going down the stretch and the, the last nine holes, last five holes, trying to trying to close it out. So it's just learning um, how you feel in that situation, how you handle the nerves and, you know, how you go about trying to close it out. So it's just kind of bottling those experiences and, and learning from them. And I'm grateful that I've had, that I had a few this year to learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen you take it to the next level here with your LPGA Tour performance. It's been limited this year, but you've been very consistent, racking up made cuts, solid finishes. I'm curious, what's been working for you here, here on the big stage, specifically with your LPGA start, starts you've gotten this season? Yeah, no, I've been grateful. I think I've had uh, five starts this year out on the LPGA. And I think, you know, I, I haven't really, you know, tried to change much or I feel like, you know, wherever you're playing, it's just, it's just the same um, Epson or LPGA. So I've just tried to kind of keep doing what I'm doing, keep trying to improve myself. Um, but yeah, the courses out here are, I think, a little bit more demanding at times than the Epson tour. Um, some not, but um, you know, I've just had to kind of learn from that and kind of adjust, you know, how I do a few things with that. Um, but no, learning, learning a lot. And it's nice to be out here and compete with the best players in the world. Definitely. And, and your game's been trending very nicely recently. So I got to ask what, what club or, or clubs are specifically been the nicest to you this year to keep things intact? Um, yeah, great question. I always like my driver. I feel like my driver is definitely one of the better clubs in my bag. Um, I would also say maybe my longer irons. Okay. Um, I feel like I can, I feel like I feel pretty confident with those. Um, and yeah, I feel like I'm a pretty good, pretty consistent ball striker. So I'd say those two. Wow. Shout out the long irons. We don't get a lot of love for the long irons in a conversation like that. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, a little bit about your relationship with Ryan. Ryan Ruffles, for those who don't know, is a pro in his own right, uh, working through Corn Ferry Q School right now. You mentioned kind of picking his brain. What is it specifically that you kind of like to ask him about as you're both going through this pro journey together? Yeah, I mean, I like to ask him about, I think, specifically um, kind of things around the green, things that kind of like a hundred yards in it. And I would say I pick his brain quite a lot, just things like simple things like into the green uh, or with the green and how to hit certain chip shots with different grasses as well. Um, I feel like he has so much golf knowledge that I, I try and take advantage of, or even like how to play a specific bunker shot, like a high one or kind of a low one. And um, just all those kind of little intricate shots that I guess someone kind of new to the game probably wouldn't, um, know too much. So I definitely try and take advantage of it. And, um, no, he's, he's been great and a huge help to me. I know your, your game's soaring right now, but you do have a big tennis background, both you and Ryan growing up. So I'm curious though. I know the older brother bullying seemingly probably never ends for you. You post a lot about it on social jokingly, but when you get revenge, is it beating him in tennis or golf? Well, what's working better for you these days against Ryan? Anything. I will take anything against my older brother. <laughs> um, but uh, hmm, we do play a lot of paddle, paddle tennis in Orlando. Nice. Um, don't play too much actual tennis. So, but I feel like I've got him in that one if we ever did play or played soon. Um, but golf is great too. I'll, I'll take him in golf too. So 
I feel like whatever I can get, it's pretty, it's pretty even upon all different sports. So I'll definitely take whatever I can get. Love it. Awesome. And again, it's Gabby Ruffles joining us. Gabby Ruffles on Instagram to follow along. Uh, let's do some fun food questions here. And let's start quickly with your off season and holiday plans. I know we're getting down to the final stretch run of the season. You've had a busy one traveling everywhere, um, getting your name out there and obviously getting yourself to the LPGA tour. But when you do take that breath in the off season, what are the plans going to look like for you? Yeah, so I'm going to Australia actually to play the Australian Open and then another little event after that. And then I'll just stay in Australia for a couple more days. Um, I'll be with my dad. So he was thinking about going to Kangaroo Island in Australia. So wow. that's like a little thing that I might do. I've heard it's amazing. Um, but I think just really for the off season is just chilling. I think that as golfers, we are traveling so much and are always kind of out of home away from home, but it's nice to just be at home for more than a week, two week stretch. So I'll just be kind of not really doing too much just at home, which I'll really enjoy. I'm sure. And then now for the real hard hitting questions, a uh, favorite holiday dish, whether it be Thanksgiving, Christmas, or anything in between, anything you're excited for? I like the turkey at Thanksgiving. Yep. Can never go wrong with that. Uh, your <laughs> potato chip preference, ruffles or lays, everyone needs to know. Oh my God. You know what? Okay. I actually don't really like ruffles chips. Um, but I feel like I should because it's my last name, but I do prefer Lay's. So that, that's a tough one. What am I going to go with? I'll have to go with Ruffles. Fascinating. You stuck to the family name. I love that. I appreciate <laughs> that. And then we, we love ending with our 19th poll question. So the last question is uh, when you get into the clubhouse at your favorite course and you just finished a great round, what's like your favorite meal and drink to order at the 19th hole? Oh, meal and drink. I love pizza. So I'd probably say pizza or pasta. And I don't really drink, but maybe like a lemonade. Oh yeah. No, that sounds great. Love it. <laughs> awesome. Gabby, thank you so much for hopping on. Best of luck this week and the rest of the season and uh, hit them straight out there. Perfect. Thank you. Gabby sounds like, um, while she wants to stay true to her name, Alex, but she's, mm. she's really a Lays fan. That's what I really conflicted like. her with that question. It's one of those things where I thought that question may have been asked to her a hundred times, but I'm not sure it has. That was a layup for me. As soon as I saw I was interviewing Gabby Ruffles, you knew I had to ask about potato chips. So yeah. I was surprised to see that she was leaning Lay's for a while before she stuck by the family name there. That, that was a very telling moment. And I, I appreciate her honesty and her candor on that on that question as well. Yep. Gabby did end up finishing tied for 38th at the Annika Driven by Gamebridge at Pelican. They have really long names for events at the LPGA. A little clunky. A little clunky. Yeah, they could shorten that for sure. I'm sure Annika would like to shorten it to maybe just the Annika. And, and we can yep. do that informally. But yeah, like you mentioned, good to see Gabby play another weekend. Like we said, you know, she's gotten what, six, seven starts now and has made the cut in like practically all of them. That consistency is going to build on itself, and we've seen that with players going up the ranks. So we're going to see a lot more Gabby on LPGA leaderboards and looking forward to following her journey as well. Yep. Lilia Vu did end up taking the W. Yeah. Uh, Fourth win sorry, of the year for her. Another win. Crazy. Yeah, just geez, crazy. You know what else is crazy, Alex? Yep. Angel Cabrera. Mm, there's a blast from the past name for, for those who don't remember masters champion u.s yep. open champion um, beloved felon. cigarette smoker as well too <laughs> convicted felon oh yeah that's right convicted felon yeah. <laughs> he just got out of prison uh in case you were wondering what happened to him the last few years yep. uh and he wants to get back onto the pga tour he does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's a little under three years in the pen and he says it was good for him, Mike. He says he's a changed man. He's reformed, um, obviously went on, went in there um, on some not so great charges uh, against some former lovers of his. Um, but the bottom line is that Angel Cabrera is out of prison and looking to get back into the ranks uh, of professional golf. He's about due to be playing in the PGA Tour champions. Now, his past status and the wins that he's had – would theoretically have him out there regularly, and 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 the the uh, the overarching question is, you know, the repentance and the forgiveness in the moment for what this is. Mike is is Angel Cabrera going to be welcomed with open arms back to PJ Tour Champions events? Is Angel Cabrera going to be welcomed back to Augusta National, where he's a green jacket holder in his own right? Uh, that's the question that we're sitting on right now, as this article got released this week. Yeah, you know, if uh, here here's a better question, maybe who has a better chance of playing at Augusta again during the Masters, Angel Cabrera or Phil Mickelson? Mm, interesting, because the you know, arguably, 
Phil Mickelson for sure. Not really not on Hill Cabrera because his the, these legal troubles and the, the amount of trouble he's gotten himself into are, are going to have to take a lot of apologies. I don't know exactly how his path back is going to work or if he's going to have to completely earn his card in the PGA Tour Champions. Like I said, I do know that his status and the amount of tournaments he's won are enough to qualify him for events. But the question is, you know, like, are these tournaments going to let someone with that background come back? And is that apology going to come full cycle? He seems like a, a grieved man that's very apologetic. So I'm going to be interested to see the next few months, like where the Masters and Augusta National and where the tour stand on letting someone back into the game like this. Definitely something worth watching in the months ahead. It will be for sure. Um, I don't know how I feel on it. I almost feel like I don't want to see him again. I'm torn. I'm, I'm torn. Like, it's yeah, interesting like, because yeah. he's one of those guys where when you read about why he went to prison and you can absolutely do that on your own time, it's really not not a great thing at all to read why he went to prison. But, you know, you remember kind of who he was before and the personality and what he brought to the game. And if he truly is sorry for everything he did and he's trying to make himself a new man, and pa- pave a, a new path and golf for himself. Uh, maybe the the opportunity for forgiveness is there. So we'll see what happens with Angel Cabrera in the, in the next few months. That uh, that Augusta National decision is the one that I'm very curious about. We'll, mm. we'll hear about that in due time. South Africa, Alex, mm. is uh, known been. for, uh, you know, maybe being the place to go for a nice little African safari vacation. Crazy, crazy wildlife there. I've I've had friends and friends, family members who've been there and taken just the most unbelievable jaw dropping photos and videos like on the safari hunts. And that's exactly what two of the best golfers in the world did last week. That's right. Max Holma and Justin Thomas did a little double date safari. Yep. Because they were down there for the DP World Tours Ned Bank Championship. Mm-hmm. And then Max Homa screwed around and won the golf tournament too. Just, yeah. just for funsies, just to cap Ca- off an awesome year. Casually got his first international victory. <laughs> <laughs> no familiarity with the course at all. <laughs> Never played the event. Fresh off vacation, inspecting elephants' poop and trying to figure <laughs> out what they ate. And here he goes winning another tournament down under. Impressive stuff from Max Homa. They said he could only win in California, but he proved him wrong, Mike. An interesting spot to win, but nonetheless, it was cool to see Max Homa and JT go down there. JT contended, had a decent week of his own, but shout out to Max Homa for putting yeah. a, a nice little capper on his gigantic 2023 uh, by getting kind of a unique venue at, at a cool destination in, in South Africa. There, Does this make Max Homa the player of the year? I mean, listen, if we're truly aligned on all these tours, if we want to truly call it an alliance, you know, between the DP World Tour and the PGA Tour, maybe those wins should count a little bit towards the player of the year. I don't know. Maybe that's something to consider for the the years to come. But uh, sarcastically, yes, but realistically, no. But all the kudos from us, because as you know, Mike, it's very hard to be good and funny and make engaging content on social media. Max Homa does that better than us, and he also is a world-class golfer. So he wears two hats that we we actually haven't worn yet. We've, we've done neither of those things so far. You know, uh, I would say I'm jealous of Max Homa, um, but – uh, he just seems like such a nice guy. I, I just, I just want to be his friend. I know you just yeah. want, you just want to cozy up and just have a drink yeah. with him and watch the game, right? Yeah, hey, yeah, shout yeah. Out Max much. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Hey, uh, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel recently, uh, like we've been saying really kind of every week, you really should. Uh, we got some uh, footage up there from uh, our our time at the Desire Cup, part one of our time at the Desire Cup at TPC Sawgrass. You'll see a little bit of the clubhouse there. You'll see more on what's going to be going on this week's video. A lot more. Yes. So part one is out now on our YouTube page. Search Course of Life podcast there. The Laura Rutledge interview, a video from the Desire Cup is in that video, along with our top golf review and our heated mini golf match. Thank God I won accommodations there on the last hole, but you're going to have to see how it all went down for yourself in part one. But like you mentioned, part two, big time behind the scenes, Mike. I don't know why. These people at TPC Sawgrass, they're very nice. They just let us roam free. And we even got a little bit of a history lesson along the way as we checked out the clubhouse and everything that that amazing structure had to offer. It's a really cool spot in the world of golf. And, and I'm excited to showcase really, it in this week's video. It really is. I, I, you know, if uh, anyone from TPC Sawgrass, the PGA Tour is listening, I'd be happy to come back uh, in, what is it, M- March, April, March? I'm down for the players. Yeah, are you interested yeah. in attending the players? Yeah. I, it's only a couple hours away. I think I can make it. I would like to go back. That's a nice yeah. idea, actually. Okay. So if the players is listening, 
Uh, we'll send them this and, and let them know that we would, we'd love to uh, to attend and, and go back to that wonderful clubhouse. Because again, that's one of those buildings where you see it on TV all these years watching the playoffs and you say to yourself, God, I wonder what that looks like inside there. And then to actually go in firsthand, well, the video is going to do it justice. So be sure to tune into YouTube and, and see the uh, the amazingness of it all. The uh, PGA Tour has their final official money event of the year. It's also, I think, right, the last like fall event. So yep. it's the last chance to like, I don't know, however the new season format is set up. I don't know how it is. Yeah, it's the top 125, Mike. So guys are trying to get inside that number. And then outside of kind of the top 50, which is already set in stone, those kind of next 10 spots are going to be all the talk this week. So you're going to see guys get into those number 51 to 60 spots. And those are important, like you mentioned earlier, because those 51 to 60 guys, they will get into some of the signature events that are so, so wealthy and rich with money for anyone who plays in them. So those are definitely lottery tickets for players. And, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity out there this week. It's the RSM at Sea Island, just down the road from me. Uh, Stuart Sink's tournament, right? Stewie Sink. Yeah, Stewie Sink, uh, uh, basically a million unofficial hosts to this event. Stewie yeah. Sink, Davis Love, Zach Johnson, you know, all the names from the late 2000s and early 2010s that we know and love. Basically, they all live in Georgia together now. You see a lot of Georgia guys that'll be in the field. Russell Henley, Cooch, you know, all those guys. Cam Young's Georgia guy that'll be in the field. Ludwig A. Oberg from the winning Ryder Cup team also teeing it up as well. So yeah, one last go at official FedEx Cup points and money uh, before we officially shut it down and, and the pros throw the clubs in the shelf for a month or two. All right, let's get to uh, this week's guest, and uh, we're checking in on a past guest for some big career updates. It was one of our, I think it was our first musician, right? Was it rapper Nick Muti yeah. uh, mm-hmm. on the podcast, and, he, and he's back. You got him back. That's right. Yeah, Nick not only has found a new person in his life, he's got a new turn for where and how his music is going to be put out, and a gigantic project, which he teases a little bit, coming up. Uh, around the bend for Nick. Really cool to connect with him, not only get the updates on his music, but his life as well. Uh, Nick Moody, always a great friend of the show. Before we get to that conversation with Nick, let's talk to you about the Live Take app. This is where sports debates are solved once and for all. And Alex, the people finally agreed with me on something. Wow, you won a debate. I won a debate. I want people to know how fulfilling this is how amazing it is to know that people agree with you after they have shoved you down and pushed you aside and said they hate you for what felt like months and years and decades what it was really maybe last like five or six or seven or eight live takes that we did and a live take is literally just the two of us talking to each other through our phones that then is recorded for about three, about five minutes, maybe less than that. We talk about a topic or anyone else on this app talks about a topic with someone else for a few minutes. And then we let the internet vote on who has the right opinion. On yeah, it's this like your own topic. version of first take. You can, you can let your take be heard. And then the audience and the internet and the public votes on you. This isn't just some private little debate. You let it get settled by the rest of the internet. And, and that's how we can tell who the true winner of the take is. That's right. Now I know that I'm a winner. It makes me feel great inside. So if you need this kind of positive reinforcement in your life, then I think Live Take is the place for you. You can find us on there, COL Podcast, Alex, COL Podcast, Michael. You can challenge us to something as well and see if you can beat us. You can probably beat me. You probably can't beat Alex. Let's just just lay it down there. (laughs) So again, Live Take, check it out on your app store, download it today, and let your take be heard. All right. Next up, we have Nick Moody joining the Course of Life, our resident New York City rapper back on the show. He's got some music and life updates for us as well. Nick, thanks for joining, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Can't complain at all. Thank you for having me. It's been good to connect, man. It's been a little bit too long, but I'm glad we got you back on the show. Um, let a little too much time slip, but we know we we both got busy with life. You got busy with music, but the newest release that I saw from you is the Cypher yeah. Tape. Uh, so I want to get into a little, a little bit about ciphers for music fans who maybe aren't as educated or need to learn a little bit more about your music. Tell me about kind of your earliest memories of understanding ciphers as it pertains to hip hop. Uh, you know, just growing up in the city, you see it all the time. It's just like people, you know, get a gather in a group and, and just rap over different instrumentals and stuff like that. 
Um, but I guess when I first started on the circuit, it's just like something that it usually happens at a showcase. Like you go to a hip hop showcase, they'll throw a beat on, everybody starts rapping kind of thing. Uh, or just in the back of the venue on the, on the street, you know, whatever it is. Um, but then I started doing more of like, uh, videoed ones, like where you go and you, you know, it was more for the video and the, and the aspect with other, you know, more prominent rappers and stuff like that. And, um, that's, you know, it just became, it's just like lively, you know what I mean? It's the energy, you know, people are freestyling, people are writing, rapping writtens and, you know, it's just a good thing to be a part of. It's, it's what hip hop is all about, you know? Definitely the cypher is kind of a little bit of an offshoot of the original like battle rap. I remember seeing in like the first days of YouTube too. I know you know enough about rap that you'll remember seeing like a young Cassidy like battling out the streets yeah. of New York and like, yeah, yeah. you know, they're all delivering their best punchlines and verses and bars for what bars. And now we've seen it transition to like award show magazine class ciphers. Mm -hmm. What 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 is it about the cipher specifically that kind of brings out maybe the best in what you're doing creatively? You know what? It's just like um, I always try to bring a different energy. You know what I mean? And and it's allowed me. I just had a lot of success with it this year. Like the, for whatever reason, I did a couple of those one train ciphers with uh, Steve Mules, who's you know a pioneer uh, videographer in New York right now. Um, and they kind of went mini viral for me. Um, a couple of them, you know, not viral, viral, but like pretty viral, like a hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, and you know, grew my fan base quite a bit. And um, I don't know. I just like, it became fun. You know what I mean? It became, it, it always kept my pen moving and being ready for the next one. And like this verse and that verse, and it just kind of like became something that people know me for, you know, and it kind of wasn't expected to be that way, but um, I've kind of gotten a little bit uh, frustrated with like the independent music uh, scene, you know what I mean? Just like how things are running. And to me that the way that going to a, a a, a cipher is just more impactful. You know, you don't have to pay anybody. You don't have to worry about anything. You meet a bunch of people, you network right, and you yeah. get to perform, you know what I mean? And it's much more, uh, it's much more about what music's supposed to be about. So, um, yeah, it's just been a, yeah, your performance in your lyrics come across very raw. It's definitely something that people need to see and hear in person. So I, I kind of appreciate the format. It, it lets your music shine for sure. And one thing that I've seen a lot with your music uh, recently, which has been really fun to watch, is the new relationship that you've developed, not only in, in the studio, but in life with, with Nikki. I want to talk a little bit about that because I'm guessing that music probably first brought uh, you two together. But tell me how you first crossed paths. It's actually a really wild story. Um, so. We're here for it. It, it. Taking it back all the time, it's actually funny. I, my, a friend of mine who, who runs this thing called the Swing Sessions uh, hit me up today and asked me to do the Swing Sessions. And this would be the first time I did it. But he had asked me to do it a long time ago. And for whatever reason, uh, he had to cancel and I couldn't make the rescheduled date. We look back on it now and Nikki was in with her old band, was on that original flyer. And who knows if we would have met then what would have happened. But later on in life, she actually was at a show performing with her old band and like this kid that was a huge fan of mine was like pestering her to follow me, like following her around, like, you'll follow Nick Moody, follow Nick Moody. You got to follow him. You got to follow him. And she, she, she was just like, all right, whatever. And, and then she, I think she didn't even follow me. She followed me like two weeks later because she saw it and she was like, and remembered that guy. And she followed me. And then, you know, I guess two years ago now I put a, poll up on Instagram just asking if there was any actresses that wanted to be in my music video. Uh, she responded and uh, we got together to do the music video. And then I was kind of like, I just knew that I, we were destined to be around each other at, at the very least. Um, and then it just grew into something, you know, much, much, much bigger than that. And now, you know, we're been dating for two years now and just making movies together. So it's been a, it's been a crazy, uh, crazy thing that that we brought it like brought us together um especially because that kid uh that made the initial connection and made her follow me passed away uh recently um so it just was a wild thing and and it just like just kind of seems like you know one of those things where you just look up and like you know how to somebody's got to be pushing the pushing the needle on this because this is nuts yeah, sorry to hear about that loss, but it's interesting that he gave you that one last yeah. touch in, in this moment and, and created that connection. It's funny how life yeah, works. Yeah. yeah, we think about it all the time, you know what I mean? Like what would have happened if that didn't happen, you know? So 
Very interesting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious because it's kind of interesting, like you mentioned that, you know, you're both going through this journey together and you talk a lot about, about that in your content, Nick Moody underscore on Instagram, follow him on all the socials as well. But tell me about what that relationship is like, knowing that you two are in the same grind and part of the same, you know, lifestyle and culture. How does that allow you to kind of communicate and vibe with one another from a relationship standpoint too? Well, I mean, let's trust me, it could be challenging because, you know, we might understand each other a little bit too much um, and call each other on our bullshit. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in a hard grind, this, this industry, you know, it's a, it's not an easy thing to crack. We've been working on it for a long time, but you know, it just allows us to, it, it for me, at least it gives me a little bit of ease. You know what I mean? Like that, that I'm with somebody that can, un, that understands what the ins and outs of this industry means and, you know, how hard it can be and, and, the ups and downs that it takes on you mentally, you know what I mean? And, sh- and to have somebody that gets that, uh, it just makes life a little, a little bit easier for me. And then on like, you know, the professional side of things, like where we, I just been able to work so much faster, you know what I mean? Like we can, mm, interesting. you know, because I can go and work my restaurant job that helps me fund all this stuff. And I know that if I need something to get done, she'll, she'll do it. You know what I mean? And we're moving like, like a, you know, a duo now because we make music together as the quiet ones as well um it just speeds up the process and i feel like i'm in two places at once which is you know a luxury very cool very very well said and, and in terms of the uh, musical content that we see between the two of you the quiet one stuff is very fascinating because i love the way you play off each other on stage just forget the relationship let's just talk about the on stage dynamic and and making that music and going back with her that kind of me male female hip hop call and response content too yeah. on stage is something that i yeah. feel like a, a, is a missing a little bit from today's game you and i grew up in the generation where it was a lot more popularized but what's that dynamic for the two of you like on stage oh it's great you know it was, it was something that we we look forward to you know what i mean we uh we have this movie coming that's more of my music, but we have a lot of music that's ready to come out after that. And, you know, performing it is, is, is the best. We actually played our first show with a band uh, about a, uh, end of August. It was my, so, it was uh, my yeah. first show. Yeah, it was, you know, the energy is just different. You know what I mean? And she can do a lot of things vocally that I can't, can't do. And, you know, I can do what she can't do. And it's together. It's just, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. And we're, we're, uh, you know, she's a great performer. So when we get together, it, it's just a fun night. Um, but, you know, it, it's also, we have different styles. So we've been working together, of trying to figure out how do we can make that mesh the best way. Um, because there are just certain, you know, sounds and, and genres that not, you know, that I can do, but it might not, it's just not a good use of what I can, can do, you know, and just finding that middle ground where we can both shine and make the best music possible is really where we're at right now. So very interesting. I, I love to hear that update. Let's talk about the, as it pertains to what's going on now in this content that you're creating, you teased it a little bit, but in terms of re- a release that's coming up, uh, the music that you're putting together with Nikki um, is part of a larger scale project, actually, that's going to be in the form of a movie. I- explain kind of what you're in, the, you're in the process of putting together right now. Well, uh, <sighs> It's 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 hard to fully explain, but we just finished uh, shooting. So, um, basically, I had a, I have a new album, and uh, it's different. It's a little bit more alternative, I would say. Um, it's a little bit darker. Um, it's just the music that I generally gravitate to, and I finally feel like I can do. Like, I think this guy back here is my favorite artist, Kurt Cobain. Um, it's if he rapped on something, it would be my new album. So I wanted to to approach it in a way that like showed the headiness and the uh, introspective style that it has. Uh, so I wanted to I wanted to create something different, and we we decided we would make a full blown short film. Um, it's probably about say twenty to thirty minutes somewhere around there it'll be. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that it will be broken up into episodic an episodic version that will drop along with the music that like, so like almost like mini music videos that might have a scene, might not have a scene, um, that'll attach to each song on the album as the music drops, but you won't, um, get the movie because we'll be pitching the movie to film festivals and stuff like that and trying to get it. Oh, okay. Interesting plan. I like it. 
So, you know, you'll see the music videos, you'll see the, the stuff like that. And you might try to follow along and you won't get it. You know what I mean? Because the, the, the actual narrative is missing. And, um, hopefully, you know, we get into some festivals and you'll see it soon enough. And, uh, it's just something different. I, I wanted to approach it in a different way. I, I felt like spending all that time on one music video and that's three minutes long when people don't even watch that long um was silly so i figured i'll do a big version i'll do a 30 minute version and then break it up to small segments that people can watch and um you know hopefully we'll uh break the mold a little bit because i think that this is something that really hasn't been done and i think that um it opens up a lot of doors for us because uh we're capable of a lot more than just music you know that's intriguing to me because often, yeah, you'll, you'll see an artist come out with a music video or maybe some sort of movie or video to accompany in their music, but it's not them on the acting side. It's maybe someone else. So seeing someone that's doing both sides and, and portraying both sides of the story is a unique thing from a content perspective as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it was not easy. It's been a long year. Uh, we started writing in January. Uh, we started getting into production in April, or May, June. And then, um, you know, we took a little break because I had the cipher tape thing kind of just happened and it was uh, a lot more work than I thought it would be, honestly. Yeah. Uh, and then we just, uh, we just finished yesterday. So, um, I'm excited about that because, you know, production stuff is not always the most fun work, uh, when you're trying to get a lot of people in one area. Um, but, I I'm really happy with what's, what, what, what's been happening. And, uh, uh, I just, I just believe in the uh, concept of it a great deal. So uh, next year is going to be fun, you know. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the the movie making and the acting chops. I know, I think when we last spoke, I remember you did a brief little scene for some of your content with a cast member, I think, from The Sopranos. But I'm sure you had to work out a little bit more of your acting chops for this uh, upcoming release. Tell me what that process was like for you. You know what? Uh, I really enjoyed it. You know what I mean? I think... Uh, I think uh, I've gotten like a, a few offers from it and stuff like that. Like as people like asking me to be in stuff. Um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, Nikki is, was an acting teacher. She, uh, she, you know, she's been an actress for a while, so she knows what she's doing. So nice. it was, again, nice. uh, she just makes that process a lot easier for me on what I should do, what I shouldn't do. Um, the headspace that I need to be in before a scene and yada, yada, yada. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, it's, I think it looks good. We'll see what people say, but uh, uh, I feel pretty good about it. And I enjoyed it, which I think is the more like that part was easy. Like being on, once we got to the set, it was a breeze, but you know, getting uh, people with their schedules on, on and the budget and all that stuff together was more of the, the challenging thing. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. All right. Now, so now we get basically the sales point, you know, South by Southwest film festivals, anyone watching out there, this is the oh. time to start following along on this content because it's the the, the, the the storm is coming, right? That's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? I don't think anybody's doing music. The scoring their own movie is really what it was. You know? <laughs> now it's a one on one. I love it. Nick Moody again joining us here. He's been on the show a few times, but it's great to have him back. Follow along on Instagram and all the socials, Nick Moody uh, and Nikki Silva's content as well, too. They do a great job with the quiet ones and everything they're putting out. Um, let's get into a little more casual talk because I know we love getting our update that you're a New, England, a New York sports fan. I'm a Boston sports fan. And I'm, I got to be honest. Let's start with the baseball end. Things have been pretty bad on both of our ends. We're, we're just down at the bottom of the pile beating up on each other. Uh, what, what's going to have to turn around for the Yankees and the Red Sox to get back at the top of the division next year? Jeez. Well, it would be nice if, if uh, our best player doesn't run into a wall that's made of concrete. That would be great. Um, that too, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. The Yankees are that, – that lineup at the – I went to a game with my dad in September, and it was just like, who, who – how is this guy up right now? The whole like they were, they had three guys under the Mendoza line. It was ridiculous. It, it just did, I don't know. I've never seen the Yankees like that. Um, and I think the same thing. Got, the Red Sox. We hired a, a GM that was going real cheap and not spending money like the Red Sox or the Yankees would. I'm like, who are these guys? We're the Red Sox. The Red Sox and the Yankees should be spending money to infinity, trying to have the best team in the AL East every year. That's the way it should be. I don't. I don't understand why they didn't go get somebody. You know what I mean? I think they got to make some sort of move because, you know, I think they relied a little bit too heavily on the farm system becoming what it was. And, and you know, guys get hurt. It's what happens. You need depth. So um, hopefully we could get Garrett Cole to, to produce another year like he did last year and, and have a better offense to go along with it. 
So, uh, what's the uh, basketball outlook on your end? How are you feeling about the Knicks as we're starting? And uh, as this is going to air, we just got going on the new NBA season. What's the outlook for the Knicks this year? I mean, it's not as good as the Celtics, obviously, but um, no, it's not. No, it's not. You said. I like the Knicks. Man. We're they still not good. over that hump, you know. I'm, 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 I'm in on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, but they haven't quite proven to me that they are championship clutch. They proved to me they are stars, but they have not proved to me they are championship clutch. If that just, makes any they sense, just, they just got a guy that's going to prove everything. That guy Drew Holiday is no joke. I hope so. And I, yeah. think that, I think that that's an underrated thing in that Bucks trade is that they lost him, and I don't care how flashy Damon and Giannis is. When it comes down to the postseason, Drew Holiday is just as valuable. So, um, I don't know. They look good. They look, I think they're going to be great. I think the Knicks are going to be good too. I just think I, it all depends on Julius Randle. You know, he can't disappear like he has in the last two years. And I've been very critical about that. I cannot stand. I, I don't know. He drives me nuts, to be honest with you. I don't like the way he plays, turns the ball over and stuff like that. But, you know, it, He's obviously he got us he got us there and we have a bunch of young players that are that are getting better. RJ Barrett looks like he's getting better with his jump shot at least. Definitely, yeah. And uh, you know, obviously Brunson is our number one our number one option, but you know, it all depends on Julius Randle. He can't disappear. It's crazy. Definitely. Um, New York wise, uh, I feel like a lot, I'm seeing an ext- extraordinary amount of New York food content. Uh, so I want to ask the expert who's there at Boots on the Ground right now. I've also seen a lot of burger content on my feed. So I'm, I'm coming to you with the question. It's real simple. Where's like the best burger you've had in New York City just recently? Could be all time or just something recently that you loved? Oh, man, you know what's crazy? I, I uh, my, The best burger I think I ever had was at a ramen place. Uh, Interesting. It, yeah, they, but but they used to get the uh, their meat from Cat's Deli, and I I forget what the name. I think it was Moo Ramen. It was called in Queens. I um, love that a ramen but, place is getting meat from Cat's Deli for their burger, though. That's that's New York fusion. If I've ever they, heard, of they it. would get like their pork, and they would make like a pork ramen dish with the Cat's Deli pork, and it was just re- it was ridiculous, like so good. And then they made a burger in the same kind of way, and it was just it was like a Kobe beef burger. And for the for twenty dollars, it was crazy. I love that. Someone out there will find that if they're in New York City. And then we're coming up on November right now, so I know you're getting together with the family soon enough for Thanksgiving dinner. What's the favorite dish at Thanksgiving that's got to be done correct? Yams. I think they're slaughtering the yams too much with marshmallows. Take it easy. You have to get a nice little burnt yam. Nothing on it. It doesn't need anything. It may if you want put cinnamon. Fine. They go crazy with the freaking marshmallows. It's nuts. <laughs> You're right because the I sweetness believe. it can go on the side. It could be an option for those who want it, but let's not tarnish the original greatness of the vegetable that we're already serving here. I don't understand like why I, I'm not a fan of like uh, people talk about like cold cheese on pizza. Why? Why are we ruining a great thing here? It doesn't make sense. It's too much. It's an overload. I, I keep it. Give me the original in a great way. That's all. So I'm going yams. I'm going regular pizza. That's it. <laughs> Excited, man. Excited for the holiday season. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see all the content coming. Uh, like he said, follow along Nick Moody, Nikki Silva on socials because I'm looking forward to seeing these episodic releases. And we're going to get to that film season and, and we're going to correspond when that time comes because we're going to see that film and, and the world's going to see that one day too. I hope so. I hope so. Awesome. Nick Moody, thank you, man, for hopping on. Appreciate you taking the time as thank always. You. And uh, best of luck with everything. Thanks a lot, man. And we're back. Great chat there with Nick. Love to hear he's branching. He's he's not really branching out. He's diversifying mm, and he's yes. writing a screenplay and shopping it. And he's going to make a soundtrack. And that's that's a lot of work. That's a lot. I mean, that's like the ultimate one man band. I know he's got help from his team and, and he shouted everyone else who's been a great support to him, and especially Nikki along the way as well. But awesome to see what Nick's doing, taking that music to the next level. We always talk about his music and he does such great storytelling. He, he, he paints such a picture with his words. And I love that about Nick's music. So to take that and actually put it to big screen and actually take it to a, a movie level concept is really exciting. So again, follow along uh, Nick Moody underscore and I K Moody underscore on Instagram. I love checking out his clips, his reels, his performances. The dude is always on the grind and we love having him on and supporting him. 
And if you like that conversation with Nick, plus everything else we do here on this podcast, make sure you punch that subscribe button right now. Yep. It's good. You missed it. But guess what? You can still do it. It's okay. Also, give us a rating. Four stars is ideal. Three is okay. Two is cruel. And one is downright mean. But I'll take it. Yeah, it's I okay. would take the one star. Again, yeah. it means that you actually have the action to to vote on us. So no one good. has given us one star. So it's a challenge, isn't it? You're challenging I guess people. So. I am. <laughs> I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Uh, that's what I'm doing. But hey, let's get to the back nine. Let's talk yep. college football. Another winning week for you, Alex. Exciting. How's it feel? We're finally putting something together. You know, we're just we're, we got two back back to back winning weeks here. Five and four last week. Five, three and one on the picks this past week. I post them every Saturday morning uh, at Col Podcast on Threads. Uh, Course of Life One, Course of Life Alex, Course of Life One on Twitter. You know where to find me. But that's where the picks go. And yeah, college football's heating up right now, Mike. For for, for your thirty second update, it's an absolute chaotic scene to, to get into this final four playoff right now. It's the last 14 playoff. There are probably about nine teams that stand a chance to get in right now and two to three weeks left of games for the biggest teams in the land. So um, the Longhorns are still holding out hope. They might need some help, but uh, we're going to have a lot of angry fan bases. This is always a fun time of the year for the college football fan bases. Uh, when you're angry, you don't get into X, Y, and Z bowl game or playoff. Uh, so look forward to that carnage in the coming weeks. Give me your prediction right now mm, yes. of the surprise team that will make it into the final four. Oregon Ducks. The Oregon Ooh, Ducks okay. are going are gonna to avenge the loss to Washington from earlier this year, and they're going to get it when it matters the most. And they're going to be the fourth and final team in because I'm predicting a little bit of chaos up top. A couple mm. teams going to lose that you may not think will. And maybe, maybe the Texas Longhorns stand a chance to slide in there if they can win out as well. But yeah, watch out Watch out for the Oregon Ducks the next few weeks. Interesting. All right, let's talk the NFL. It's our least favorite thing to talk about on this podcast now. It used to only be my least favorite thing. Mm. But the level of ineptitude and horribleness coming out of your Patriots and my Giants, we're not talking about mediocrity. We're talking about the worst football that's currently being played. I, I I don't think we have the worst records in the NFL between the two of us, but it feels like to us, because this is our world, that we are so bad, so bad, that I, I'm willing to venture that my high school's football team wow. could beat my Giants right now. I mean, with Tommy DeVito, a quarterback, you might be right, honestly. <laughs> it has just been an absolute disaster for both of our teams and it's funny because this football segment has kind of always been either like you know both of our teams have hope or i'm churning like i always am and you're not but now that we're both in the mud this has been become such a race to the bottom that we have to keep this going now we have to keep talking about this because it's yes. so unbelievably bad that it's now content in the worst way <laughs> for how bad we are the patriots lose in germany 10 to 6 Mike, yeah. 10 to 6. Mac Jones benched by Bill Belichick with two minutes left in the game after throwing a stupid interception for Bailey Zappi. And he immediately throws an interception of his own, and we lose again to go to two so, and eight now. My, my question Mac Jones has been benched in almost like the last three times. Yes, the, you're three games. Last three, three games, right? He's been benched somewhere <laughs> after the first half. What? And, and Bill Belichick still says he's my starting quarterback. Hmm. At what point is he not your starting quarterback well, anymore? Thankfully, we got the bye and we got fourteen prepare days to prepare for you guys. And okay. We're going to need so, all. We're going to oh need God. all fourteen, by the way. Just <laughs> okay. Wait, wait. Is Mac Jones going to get benched halfway through the bye week? No, I think we're going to go with a new <laughs> starter. That's my early call right now. We'll have this conversation again in seven days. My early call is that Will Greer, out of nowhere, former quarter, cow, uh, backup quarterback for the Cowboys, or Bailey Zappi will start. I think Mac Jones really, really is done and actually benched. That's that's my take right now we'll revisit that in seven days like i said as for you guys we got 14 mm. days to prepare for the giants to see if we can get this elusive third win of the season <sighs> meanwhile you guys are in the exact same spot and mm -hmm. you've got a guy named tommy devito that still yeah. lives at home with his parents playing quarterback he's saving money <laughs> he's saving money man <laughs> but mike when you're an nfl player 
and you know that your quarterback walk, <laughs> walking into the locker room still lives at home with Ma and Pa and is getting pasta made for him. I don't know. There's just a certain lack of toughness that that exudes. I don't know if that's the greatest look. So it brings me to this debate. He's, I think, 23 or 24. How old is too old to still be living with your parents? I was still living with my parents when I was 24. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, what's the number? What's the cutoff point? Uh, when, is uh, it, when is it bad and creepy? When is it, okay. when is it wrong? Well, well, the question is, are you living with your parents rent free? Or are you? Yeah, I think there's a point where you start paying rent and you start. Mm-hmm. There starts to be greater expectations of what you do in the house. And how much are you? Are you like, do they pay for your food? Do they cook for you? Or is this like we're just sharing the same living space? Well, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say food. I hope he's paying some rent because his rookie contract <laughs> is netting him about 500 to 700 K a year, Mike. So I, yeah. I think he could stand to afford his own place. Just a wild guess. But you know what? I don't I don't know what kind of debt he has. We don't know. I don't think it's <laughs> fair to assume this. And if his parents are supporting him and can give him the, the support he needs to be the quarterback the Giants need, then I'm all for it. That said, he's got to do a whole lot better than whatever it was that just happened this past week against the Cowboys. All right. Well, for me, it starts with getting his own apartment. So we'll see if he does that in the next week or two. And maybe I'll, tr- I'll come around on Tommy DeVito. But uh, regardless, the race to the bottom rolls on for both of our extremely sad NFL teams. All right, let's hashtag always end with food. Yep, our food segment to end every course of life, the 19th hole of the podcast, if you will. Check out always end with food on Instagram. And it's that time, Mike. I, yep. I want to get this out this week mm-hmm. because by the time people listen to next week's episode, it's already going to be too late. It's too late. The PSA needs to come right now. You need to be shopping and collecting your Thanksgiving things right now. And remember, that bird needs to be defrosting for at least yes. a few days. Just want to if, get that out there. If, okay, so I bought my bird this weekend and I I uh, already am planning Friday night that bird comes out of the out of the freezer. How excited are you to just make that switch from the freezer to the fridge? Uh I uh, I'm okay, you know, it's all right. <laughs> that was not the answer I was looking for there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm wildly excited for Thanksgiving is what you should have said, because it comes in collaboration with your birthday week as well, too. That's right. I had to slide that in for you in case you forgot about it. Uh, Yeah, it's uh, we we talked briefly about this, uh, I think, last week of the week before uh, that. that am, Am I at 37? Are you still in your mid 30s? Yeah, you're in your it's late mid. It's late mid 30s. That doesn't help when you call it the late mid 30s. That yep. doesn't help me, Alex. Yeah. You're going to be in this position in yep. a year or two, you know. I am. I am. And until then, I'll mock. But yeah, it's late <laughs> mid 30s indeed for you. Um, but what I did see, what one incredibly mature thing that you did do is yeah. you've already got your notebook out and you're already strategizing for next week's meal. Well, I have the menu is fully planned out and I'm I'm going to be making everything and I still have to work next week. So I had to map out uh, what I'm making. What can I make ahead of time? When right. do I need to go to the grocery store and buy Good things move. and then go back to the grocery store and buy more things? Because if I buy stuff on Saturday, it may not be fresh for Thursday. So what I like fresh vegetables that I want. I don't want to get on Saturday because it, it's not going to be good for Thursday. So yeah, you start towing that line when you're five yeah. to seven days out like that. So that's definitely yeah. some good stuff to keep in mind out there for everyone starting the prep. Best of luck. You can you can get after the prep right now. And next week, we'll talk a whole lot more about it. And next week, we're going to have our annual chat with Brandy Malloy, who's got some great holiday baking, cooking and food tips as well, too. So that's all coming your way on next week's Course of Life podcast. Until then, we'll see you next week. 